Hello everyone and welcome to Eorzea Armoire, a series about the background of some of Heidelin's more epic and dense weapons, armor, and artifacts. We'll be investigating the lore of these items both within Final Fantasy XIV and the Final Fantasy franchise in general, as well as the amazing and sometimes obscure real-world people, events, and artifacts upon which they are based. Ascalon is a fairly common name used in fantasy games, but most of us will probably recognize it first as a war-torn region from the Guild Wars universe that represents a front line between the humans and the Char. It has also been used as a name of Endgame Swords in Capcom's Dragon's Dogma and the 2008 Square Enix title Infinite Undiscovery for the Xbox 360. It was also the name of the personal aircraft of Winston Churchill during the Second World War for reasons that should become understandable as we progress. In our modern world, some of us might recognize the name Ashkelon as that of a city on the Mediterranean coast in southern Israel, and like so many Mediterranean cities, it carries the burdens of an incredibly long and turbulent history. It is named for and built on and around the site of the original ancient seaport Ashkelon, which was established sometime between 5 and 10,000 BC during the Neolithic era, and was occupied and ruled through history by respectively the ancient Egyptians, the Philistines, Israelites, Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, Hasmoneans, Romans, Persians, Medieval Arabs, and Crusaders, before it was destroyed by the Mamluk Sultanate in the 13th century. The most culturally significant moment in this city's life has been considered by most to be the Battle of Ascalon, when after a long but successful siege of Jerusalem in 1099, Godfrey of Boyon learned that a massive army of 50,000 men from the Shia Caliphate of Fatimid was riding out to take the city back from them, and so he marched to Ashkelon with the beleaguered surviving crusaders of an estimated only 1,200 knights and 9,000 infantry. All accounts insist that the crusaders were grossly outnumbered, but with the initiative they caught their adversary by surprise outside the city and were rewarded with a decisive victory which effectively ended the First Crusade. With the Church of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem captured and secured, and the Battle of Ashkelon thwarting the Fatimid attempts to respond, most of the surviving crusaders returned to Europe whilst Godfrey took his place as Regent of Jerusalem, or as he described it, Defender of the Holy Sepulchre. Returning crusaders brought to Europe with them a hagiography that had been conjured or inspired during their holy bloodbath in the east of an older Catholic patron, St. George. He was a Roman tribunus, born in the late 3rd century to Greek Christian parents and favoured of the Emperor Diocletian until the Emperor decreed the largest and bloodiest official persecution of Christianity in Roman history. George publicly renounced the edict and declared himself a Christian and after failed attempts by the Emperor to convert him and a long and gruelling torture, he was decapitated and thereafter honoured as a martyr. He naturally captured the imagination of medieval Christian communities and became the subject of a number of tales of Catholic mythology and one of these is that which the Crusaders brought back to the European courts, the legend of St. George and the Dragon. It's a common and well-known story, so the summary I give you here will be terse. The tale goes that St. George was travelling through Libya, and passed by the fictitious city of Lazio, where he heard of a terrible blight upon the locals. A noxious dragon had settled in the lake some time before, and poisoned the surrounding land, sparing the city on the condition that the regent would send it a pair of sheep as a sacrifice every day. When the city's livestock was depleted, they resorted to setting up a lottery with all the names of the city's youth for the daily sacrifice. It so happened that the king's own daughter had suffered the draw, and that the people's insistence was now being left out by the lake for the dragon at the same time as George was riding by. He hastened to her aid despite her protesting that he would surely be killed, and the dragon was unable to harm him of course because he was wearing a crucifix. So he wounded the dragon with his lance, tied the princess's girdle around its throat and dragged it back to the city where he declared that he would kill it for them if only the entire city consented to convert and be baptized. They did so to a man and so George executed the dragon with his lance and sometimes his sword which is named in the medieval stories Ascalon, presumably as a sign of prophecy for the battle that would occur some several hundred years later. The legend of St. George has some ready parallels to one with which players of Heaven's Ward are familiar. 
that of Haldrith taking up the lance of his slain sire King Thorden I during the first battle of the Dragonsong War and using it to put out the eye of Nithog. Although in our echo of the aftermath the lance is very clearly a gay bulg, we have seen that this type of lance is used widely enough by Ishgardian dragoons that gay bulg is probably not a unique name but that of the design. And we have reason aplenty to believe that the particular lance wielded by Thordon I and inherited by Haldrith was in fact named Ascalon. When Thordon VII ascended to the primal form of King Thordon I, a great sword formed around the eye of Nidhogg named Ascalon. Not only are many of his attacks named for the sword, he refers to the sword itself when he plunges it into the ground. O Ascalon, drink deep of the power of slumbering gods. The primal Thordon himself does not much resemble the historical king. I think it is reasonable to construe that his weapon, despite being a sword here rather than a lance, has similarly taken the name of that artifact. Either way, in this appearance we have a reference to both of the significant Ascalons of which we have been discussing. Firstly, we have a lance that was used to maim an adversarial and culturally significant dragon. It did not kill him, but we learned through the story of Heaven's War that it very nearly did, in fact taking both of his eyes and leaving him powerless. It is ironic here that the piercing of the dragon by Ascalon would mark not the end, but the beginning of the people's torment. Secondly, we have a salient icon of the culmination of bloody and fanatical crusades, that of both the historical First Crusade and the ascendance of Thordon VII and the Heaven's Ward. That the Ascalon wielded by the primal Thordon now explicitly channels the power of the very same dragon which the original was intended to vanquish says something quite profound to the nature of Holy Crusades, how often they represent, embody, and perpetuate the very evils to which their historical guiding maxims were diametrically opposed. Given that neither the Dragoon nor the Dark Knight weapons dropped from Thord in the name to Ascalon, I doubt that we will ever personally wield this legendary weapon, but I think that it proves all the same a fascinating installment for this series. With that said, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with your friends or on social media. I do apologize that there haven't been more of these videos recently, but we all know exactly what 3.15 will be bringing us. Until then, thank you so much for watching, I'm Ethis, and this has been Eorzea Armoire.